have opinions on. So when we left off last class, we had introduced the idea of muscle tension. So the muscle contracts, tension pulls the ends of the sarcomere together, and then we register that as force outside of the muscle. You apply force to something you're pushing across the floor, but it's tension in the muscle that allows you to make that force. And we asked, how do we generate tension? How do we increase tension? There were two ways we could either recruit more muscle or amplify the muscle that was already turned on. And we talked about the first option already, recruiting more muscle, activating more motor units. All right, a motor nerve will innervate muscles of the same fiber type. We can bring in more motor units of the same or different fiber types to help increase force generation in the muscle. The other way is to amplify the activated muscle. To make the tension stronger or make more tension in the fibers that are already on. And so we'll, uh, we'll start with the base unit of, of tension generation. And this is the first exercise that you would have seen in lab this week, the twitch contraction. One small little burst of uh, electrical stimulation applied to the muscle, and then you register the force produced or the signal on the screen. So a twitch contraction is just a very brief, minuscule activation of the muscle and the resulting uh, force that's generated. So that's what we're looking at here. A brief contraction, the force generated, as the line goes up, more force is registered. As it goes back down, the force subsides, and that takes some amount of time. So imagine that you could look at one fiber only. Forget the muscle. You're looking at one fiber, packed with myofibrils, and we're measuring the amount of force in that, in that fiber. To assess how the signal is transmitted and the force is generated, we need to understand the, the cycle of contraction. The first phase that we see on this graph is the latent period, which is a delay. In other words, it's a delay. The latent period is the period in which the signal is being translated. The muscle is translating the action potential into its own language. There's some electrical signal. The muscle says, okay, that wants me to generate force. And the latent period is the time in which the signal is being transmitted. It washes over the membrane. Calcium is released. And we're about to start contracting. It takes some time for all of those things to happen. And that time is the latent period. Now once contraction is activated, once calcium is available, tension builds, the muscle starts to shorten, and we're in the main phase, the contraction phase. Notice the force is rising to a peak as calcium opens up more and more actin sites, more cross bridges are created. If there's energy nearby, myosin will contract, the head will cock, and climbs or pulls on the actin filaments, the muscle contracts and force is generated. Now, there's only some inherent ability to contract the muscle at this point. When the signal gets there, it releases some amount of calcium. That calcium does its job to allow the cross bridges. And when that calcium runs out, when there's no other cross bridges to be made, the muscle relaxes. In this phase, we're also actively putting calcium away. It's such a potent signal, not only for myosin, but for a whole host of other enzymes that we're going to refer to today. Calcium turns on enzymes, turns on metabolic pathways, turns on the mitochondria, turns on myosin. We want to make sure we keep it secret. We pack it away when it's not in use. So during the relaxation period, we store calcium once again. What's not on here is the fourth period in the contraction cycle, which is the refractory period. A lot like neurons, 
a lot of these are, are, are similar to um, this, the, the phases, the periods in uh, neuron signal transmission. There's a refractory period where the muscle fiber can't be activated. In the refractory period, no amount of signal will turn the muscle on. There's a very brief window where it is not responsive. It's very brief. It's on the order of one to two milliseconds. I've enlarged that window for you here. This looks like five milliseconds, but it's a very brief blip for skeletal muscle. Right at the start, as soon as the signal arrives at the muscle, the muscle is inactivated briefly, and then the contraction cycle continues. This doesn't really matter as much for skeletal muscle. We want muscle to be able to be activated repeatedly. We'll see why as we build tension today. But this becomes really important for cardiac muscle. So it's important to introduce the concept here. Cardiac muscle has a much longer refractory period. And that's really important because you want to make sure you always contract cardiac muscle in order. You want to pump, uh, pump blood in a certain direction. You want to contract in order. You're going to learn more about that in the second semester, but cardiac muscle differs from skeletal muscle in that regard as well. So there is a brief refractory period. It's almost not even worth mentioning, but just know that it exists and the muscle is not responsive during that period. In practice, we don't ever run into problems with the refractory period. We send signals You'll send a chain of signals, and they'll all get through and activate the muscle. And that is temporal summation once again. Wave summation, as it's referred to here, because as force builds, it has a wavy appearance. Temporal summation was the name that we had for it when we talked about the, uh, the nervous signal strength. Firing a nerve more quickly made it more likely that an action potential would be registered in the postsynaptic neuron. Remember that? Of course you do. Well, the same thing happens here. We're firing a nerve, the alpha motor nerve, more quickly. Temporal summation occurs, and the tension builds accordingly. So this happens after the refractory period. And then it allows us to build more force than we would build with one twitch on its own. So you can see on the left-hand side here, the force generated with one twitch. You can see it. The force generated with one twitch. What happens if we send another signal before it relaxes? Well, force builds. I send two signals, the second one occurs before the muscle is completely relaxed, force builds to a higher degree in that muscle fiber than it would have otherwise. What if I send more than two signals? Here I'm going to send four signals. Each of those signals occurs before the, the fiber is completely relaxed, and we have this stair-step wavy pattern where tension in the fiber builds. And this stair-step pattern is specifically called unfused tetanus. There's a little bit, there's, there's a brief relaxation. There's some time between each signal where the muscle can start to relax, but it never fully relaxes, and then force builds as each signal gets sent. It's possible, and you might have had fun in lab doing this, to send the signal so quickly that there is no relaxation. What I'm describing is called fused tetanus. So send a very quick, high-frequency train of signals, gets this, uh, the tension building at a rapid pace in the, in the muscle until it reaches some plateau, its limit. There is a fixed limit where the muscle can't generate any more tension can't generate any more force. But we don't see that wavy stair-step pattern here. We call that fused tetanus.
So notice the difference, and I, I shaded the, uh, the boxes in here, just notice the difference between the amount of force produced and the amount of time it takes to produce that force. There's some small amount with one twitch. There's a larger amount, that is the box is taller for a longer period of time as we add a second impulse. And the more impulses we add, and the closer together they are, the more force is produced over a longer period of time. This is how we're able to create graded force of contraction. Light contraction, medium contraction, and heavy contraction. This in addition to recruiting more motor units. Now it's tempting to think, what we've talked about so far is how to turn the muscle on. And it's tempting to think that the muscle starts from completely off. But that's not the case. There's always some basal tone within the muscle. There's always some mild tension within the muscle. And maybe think about postural muscles as everyone sits up straight and adjusts their posture. Postural muscles, those muscles that help keep you standing, help maintain balance so you don't fall over. Soleus, gastrocnemius, intercostals, uh, erector spinae muscles, quadriceps, hamstrings, many different postural muscles. There's some basal tone that's always being modified slightly to make sure that you don't fall forward on your face or slump forward in your chair. There's always some basal tone. And just like we talked about, the motor units alternating when you were running a marathon or doing some long-lived exercise, some motor units might get tired and so others take over. Just like we alternate motor units for exercise, we'll do that at rest as well. That basal tone can be taxing over 12 hours in a day. And so we'll alternate the motor units that are inactivated to, or that are activated to make sure that basal tone is maintained. Ensure the muscles remain taut. It supports posture, limb position. It allows us to maintain body heat. Remember way back at the beginning of the section, we talked about muscle contraction being inefficient. 80% of the energy that you use during contraction is, just escapes as heat. Well, maintaining posture are slight contractions, modifying contractions, low-level contractions that help keep us warm. When that's not enough, what do you do? You shiver. You activate your muscles more forcefully and more frequently to generate body heat. So basal tone is maintained even if the muscle isn't voluntarily active. If you do activate the muscle, that is, if you choose to flex a joint or extend a joint, you are voluntarily contracting the muscle and making movement. You're generating an isotonic contraction. And I really don't like this name. Isotonic contraction is a misnomer. That is, it doesn't describe really what's going on. Isotonic says tension stays the same as you contract the muscle. Now, I could pull the class and ask, do you agree with that? Tension stays the same as you contract the muscles. As you flex the elbow joint, tension stays the same throughout the range of motion. Of course not. We saw the length tension curve changes, right? There needs to be some optimal amount of overlap. Tension is highest in the middle and lowest at the extremes. So isotonic isn't the right word to describe how force is being generated, but it's still used everywhere. Isotonic describes the movement at a joint. Concentric contraction being the activation and shortening of a muscle. <coughs> Eccentric contraction being the uh, lengthening or relaxation of a muscle, the two halves of the contraction phase. So isotonic contraction is 
what you participate in, what you practice every time you go to the gym, every time you go for a bike ride, walking around, your muscles are moving. They are contracting and shortening. They're relaxing and lengthening. Concentric and eccentric contractions. If you were to just contract your muscle, you can voluntarily contract with no motion. What's happening there? Typically, what you'll do is you'll activate one set of muscles and you'll activate the opposing set of muscles. No motion happens. We engage in what's called an isometric contraction. That is, position or motion is unchanged. Iso, unchanged, metric, meter, or the, the, the motion of the muscle. Muscle contracts, but the length does not change. This isn't a very common type of contraction that you'll voluntarily engage in. But it is worth mentioning. So there is a difference. And if this description didn't help, you can see on the, the slide in your, in your diagram the various kinds of contraction that we just described in words. On the left-hand side, as the, the book in this case is, is lifted, the elbow is flexed, concentric contraction occurs as the book is lowered, the biceps lengthen and extend, eccentric contraction occurs, and then if this fellow just holds the book out at, at uh, shoulder level with no movement, there is a contraction, there's a force opposing the load, the force happens to be equal to the load, and there's no movement occurring. So those are the two ways to build tension. Now let's, let's take stock of where we are in this section. We talked about all the parts of the muscle, all the ingredients in the muscle. And we spent the past couple of lectures talking about what we need in order for contraction to occur, for those parts to activate and shorten. Well, at first, we realized we need to have calcium. We need a signal for there to be contraction. Calcium has to be present. We need there to be, uh, we need actin to be available for myosin. Contraction, or sorry, the cross bridges need to happen. And we've taken for granted to this point that energy is available. Energy, this was the third item we talked about yesterday, ATP, that's our form of energy, needs to be there in order for the muscles to do work. So how do we make sure that there's always a steady supply of energy? This is a really important concept. The muscle has almost innumerable systems in place to make sure that energy is always available. And the flow chart that you're looking at behind the screen here is a simplified, simplified flow chart of the metabolic pathways in skeletal muscle. So you can see the, the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, carbohydrate metabolism and glycolysis, there's glycogen metabolism, fat metabolism, nucleotide metabolism, protein metabolism, You'll learn about that in biochemistry. This is a bird's eye view. Thank goodness we're not talking about that detail today. We're going to look at a couple of these systems in their general characteristics, and we'll leave it at that. But first, what do I mean by metabolism? It's a word that we all know and we all kind of take for granted. What does metabolism even mean? The doctor says I have a high metabolism. What does that even mean? Metabolism is the sum total of all of the biochemical processes that are going on in the muscle. All of the enzymatic reactions that are going on. And broadly, we break them down into two categories. There are anabolic and catabolic reactions. Anabolic are those reactions that build something, that make order out of chaos that need energy. Catabolic reactions are destructive, where we take something with order and we break it down. We harvest energy from a structure. We recycle it. So anabolic and catabolic. 
Those two arms together are what we know globally as metabolism. So metabolism isn't just breakdown. It's not just synthesis. It's both. And the currency for metabolism in the cell, what we typically want to make on the anabolic side, what we typically break down on the catabolic side, at least in, in contracting the muscle, is ATP. This is um, our little friend ATP, the structure revealed. Adenosine is this ring structure, and the triphosphates, you can see right here, these purple balls. There's three of them, triphosphates. And you'll learn more about this in biochemistry, but essentially when we break one of them off, we get energy from it. And we can use that energy to do work. So this might help clarify some of the other concepts that we mentioned in class uh, the past couple lectures. When we break down ATP, we're taking something with structure. We are getting energy from it to do work. So, so far, we've talked about catabolic processes. The muscle contracting is destructive. Myosin wants to break down ATP to do work. It just assumes there's always going to be ATP there, and it doesn't concern itself with where it comes from. It's the job of the metabolic pathways that we'll talk about today to make sure myosin has a full supply of ATP. So the muscle consumes ATP during contraction. It doesn't do anything to replace it, but it must be replaced. How do we derive ATP? There are three main pathways through which, well, three and a half arguably four. But there's three main series of steps, enzymes in a sequence. There are three main pathways that produce ATP in the muscle. Two of them are what I call, or what are more properly called, substrate level phosphorylation. I'm, I'm realizing that that word might not make a whole lot of sense. Let's refer to this ATP picture for a second. When we break off a phosphate, we are dephosphorylating. Dephosphorylating, taking away a phosphate. If we were to add that back on, we would be phosphorylating. So substrate level phosphorylation is something that uses molecules in the cell to put this phosphate back on. That's all we're talking about. That first system is the creatine phosphate system. The second system is, in quotes, anaerobic glycolysis. And it's in quotes because I don't agree with it, but it's there because you might have heard it referred to as anaerobic glycolysis in the past. I'll tell you why I don't agree with that coming up. Technically, all glycolysis is anaerobic, but there's always oxygen available in the muscle. And remember at the start of class when I said I was going to try not to rant? I just caught myself. A hot topic. The last pathway is oxidative phosphorylation. So we have substrate level molecules in the cell add the phosphate. And then oxidative phosphorylation is the process that uses oxygen to add a phosphate. In all cases, we're just building ATP once again. We're just adding a phosphate back. That's all we're doing. This long, complicated lecture achieves that one simple goal of putting this phosphate back on to ADP. So these three systems. Skeletal muscle has the ability to use all of these all the time. We can emphasize one over the other, but they all turn on at the same time. The three that we just mentioned on the last slide are, are complemented by another brief source of energy, and that's why I said three and a half initially. In your muscle right now, 
there's some energy already. There's some ATP to begin with. And maybe what I'll do before I get into this slide is I'll, uh, I'll show you what I'm, um, or, or I'll describe what I'm showing you on this picture. This is whatever your job is, however much energy you need, where does it come from? So I'm not looking at the strength of contraction. Is it low, medium, or high? Whatever it is, I need energy from somewhere. So this is telling me where the energy comes from. Uh, does half of the energy come from one place? Ultimately, it should all add up to 100. All of the things on the slide should add up to 100. This is the percent of ATP provision over time as you start to exercise. So let's start to exercise right now at time zero, and then over the course of three and a bit minutes, where does the energy come from? In the first couple seconds, there's some energy in your cell right now, and you will use that energy. This was the half a system that I mentioned. You're using some of the energy that's already available. You're not making any yet. If you didn't make any, you'd run out in five seconds. So we need to make some energy pretty quickly. Luckily, the phosphocreatine system ramps up really quickly. It's like a seesaw. As soon as there's an imbalance, it will move in the appropriate direction. So within seconds of you beginning to exercise, you start to get ATP from the phosphocreatine system, and you get a fair amount of it. But the problem is it doesn't last very long. So the third system, which is also activated right away, it's a bit slower to take off, starts to provide energy as soon as the phosphocreatine system runs out or doesn't contribute as much. Glycolysis starts to provide ATP. And this lasts maybe a minute or so. The, the majority of the energy comes from glycolysis at 40 to 60 seconds. And these are placeholders for the big daddy ATP provision system, oxidative phosphorylation. If you are doing endurance type exercise, this is where you get the best bang for your buck. Oxidative phosphorylation, it's slow. It takes a minute and a half or two minutes to turn on fully. When it does, you get 30 times the ATP, 30 times the energy, it's very efficient. What's important to note about this figure is that all of these systems turn on at the same time. You can't just only turn on the phosphocreatine system. You can't only turn on aerobic metabolism. You can emphasize one or the other depending on the type of exercise you're doing. And I'll leave that explanation for Dr. Kane in XFIS. But they all turn on together. Second, at any point along this graph, if you draw a vertical line, all of the energy system should add up to 100%. Where's the energy coming from? Well, on the left, 90% is coming from phosphocreatine, 5% is coming from glycolysis, maybe 4% from ATP, and 1% from oxidative phosphorylation. All that adds up to 100 the second bar on the right-hand side, where's the energy coming from? Half of it's coming from oxidative phosphorylation. Half is coming from glycolysis. At any given point in time, these lines should all add up to 100%. This is what systems are contributing energy to do the work in the muscle. Or what is the relative contribution of energy production in the muscle? So let's briefly describe these systems and try to understand how they work. You guys on board? Describe the systems. Phosphocreatine. I'm going to avoid discussing ATP first, right? We've already seen that one. 
You break out the phosphate, you get energy. We know what that system's all about. How do we make new ATP using the phosphocreatine system? Phosphocreatine. Creatine is a, a molecule you've probably heard about. We're not going to talk about supplementation or whether it works or any of that stuff. All you need to know is that creatine is a molecule inside the muscle, and it gets a phosphate. When you take it in in your diet, it gets a phosphate. So creatine gets a phosphate. At rest, you make phosphocreatine. At rest, this is a stockpile of phosphate. You have energy in the muscle when you take in creatine in your diet. Uh, energy is used, you phosphorylate it, it adds the phosphate group, and then we save it for later. So at rest, we build up phosphocreatine inside the muscle. At rest, there's an abundance of energy. <laughs> You're recovering from exercise. You're sitting there, you're thinking hard, you're using some energy to write notes and process the information, but you, you have a lot of reserves. At rest, there's little demand for energy, so some of the energy goes to making phosphocreatine. Now, what do I mean by save it for later? When I start to exercise, I've got a large supply of phosphocreatine in the muscle. I just made it at rest. Now I'm going to start to contract the muscle. And remember this, uh, this green sphere that was ATP? As soon as I start to exercise, I break that stuff down. If there's some on hand, I'll use that. But there's not very much on hand. So I need to be able to replace it quickly. As soon as I start using ATP, this goes down. It pulls this reaction ahead. Phosphocreatine sits there in a reserve in the muscle. It says, hold on, you're exercising. Let me help you out. I have extra phosphate. I'm going to give that phosphate to ADP and then resynthesize ATP. Make new ATP so that you have energy to contract. This happens within fractions of a second. As soon as ADP is available, this will move forward. So creatine phosphate, CP or PCR as I've written on other slides, acts as a reservoir. The more you have of this in the cell, the more quickly you can make new energy for contraction. And that's the extent of our discussion of phosphocreatine. There's more to it, but know that it acts as a phosphate reservoir. Next, glycolysis. And I'm running out of time. I really can't rant about glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis. You might have heard a statement like this. When phosphocreatine stores are depleted, glucose is converted into pyruvic acid to generate ATP. Well, creatine phosphate stores can be depleted when you're doing really intense sprint exercise. But because these all turn on at once, you can think of it more as glycolysis taking over. You don't really run out of phosphocreatine. Glycolysis takes over. And pyruvic acid, ignore that for now because that doesn't exist in the body. I have a brief slide on that coming up. Glycolysis is a long, drawn-out pathway that you might have to memorize in biochemistry. You're not going to have to memorize it. Glycolysis is simply glycolysis, the breakdown of glu uh, glucose, lysis of glucose, lysis of carbohydrates. More correctly, pyruvate is produced. That actually doesn't matter, so don't worry about it. Um, glycolysis is turned on with everything else in the muscle as you start to exercise, and this is unique because it has a really high flow potential. You can move things through this pathway fast. And you will when you get to X-Phys and you do the Wingate test, for instance. It has a really high flow potential. And every time you move glucose through this pathway, you get some energy. 
you get two ATPs. Well, that's great. It's better than phosphocreatine already. I mean, there's more steps, but you get a higher yield. At the end of glycolysis, we've got the third pathway we're going to talk about at the next slide. This is a connection point to aerobic metabolism. We like for glycolysis to give us the, uh, the ingredients for aerobic metabolism, but sometimes the sink overflows. Sometimes glycolysis moves too quickly for the aerobic system. And in that case, where it overflows, you produce lactate as a byproduct. And again, lactate is one of Dr. Kane's favorite intermediates. He's done a whole host of research and studies on lactate, so you can ask him about it. But lactate's produced when this moves too quickly, when glycolysis moves too quickly. And then the third pathway that we haven't talked about yet is too slow. But glycolysis gives us two ATPs. That's great. And we can do it really quickly. That's fantastic. We get a really high rate of ATP production. Typically, we have a high rate of ATP production, but it can only last for a short period of time. Some things turn the system off. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So we need this third option. We need this third option to generate ATP over the long term. Third option is inside the mitochondria as pyruvate goes in. It is phosphorylated using oxygen. And that's an oversimplification. Pyruvate's not phosphorylated. There's a whole host of things wrong with that statement, but it's not the point of this course to talk about. So under aerobic conditions, pyruvate enters the mitochondria. There's a series of steps. Ultimately, they require oxygen, and then ATP is spit out at the end. And right now, we're considering it as a black box. We don't know all the steps inside the mitochondria. We're just going to say, OK, pyruvate comes in. There's oxygen available. We get 30 or 32 ATP, depending on how you do the calculations. And you make CO2 and water. Wow, okay, 16 times the, um, the ATP produced in glycolysis, 30, 32 times the ATP produced in phosphocreatine. There's a lot of energy being produced with this system. I'd probably want to use this as often as I could to make sure that muscle contraction could be sustained for long periods of time. There are, there's another figure on your slide, but let's ignore it. We're not going to talk about the, the steps or the metabolism of it. Just understand that oxygen is required. We make a lot of ATP, and we produce CO2 and water as a byproduct. Now, given that we only have, what do we have? We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to talk just about lactic acid, and then I'll show you a fun video about how we know all this stuff and then we'll call it for the day. So on the last couple slides, I crossed out lactic acid. And there was lactic acid on the uh, oxidative phosphorylation slide, and that's wrong. And I'll tell you why lactic acid is wrong, and it's not a thing that's in the body. So when your massage therapist tells you that oh, you're getting rid of the lactic acid by rubbing the muscles, you're like, well, that's not a thing. Let me tell you why. Or when someone says in the gym, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm lactic right now. You can tell them, well, you're not, because lactic acid is not a thing. Let me tell you why. Does that happen to you a lot? OK, so just a quick note. You'll get more about this in biochem. What's an acid? What's an acid? An acid is a thing that can give a hydrogen ion. So what is acidic? Acidic is an environment that has a lot of hydrogen ions. So lactic acid, quote unquote, would be something that can contribute hydrogen ions after glycolysis. Pyruvic acid would be a substance that could give off or donate hydrogen ions. The problem is those don't exist at 
the body's neutral pH. It's just a fundamental physical law. They don't exist at a pH of 7.7. .7. They do exist as acids at really low pH, which is a very acidic environment to begin with. But if you reach that pH in your body, you're dead and you're sitting in a vat of acid because it's not possible to generate that level of acidity in the body. You might be able to get to 6.5 or 5 on the pH, 6.5 or 6 on the pH scale, but that's very acidic. Those molecules don't exist. They can't physically exist at our body's pH. So lactic acid and pyruvic acid are not a thing. For that matter, I'm going to give you a glimpse into the biochemistry of it. Yay, right? Just a glimpse. When you make lactate, you actually get rid of hydrogen ions. Well, hold on. An acid gives, gives off hydrogen ions. An acidic environment has a lot of hydrogen ions. If I'm taking hydrogen ions, that seems to sound like I'm making it less acidic. So when I make lactate, am I really making the environment less acidic? Yeah. Let's just do a quick, quick look at the biochemistry of it. This is pyruvate being converted to lactate. There's a hydrogen ion that's floating around inside the muscle. Right now, the muscle is somewhat acidic. And then as lactate forms, you can follow it as it's bound to lactate in its, uh, in its molecular structure. It binds hydrogen ions. It removes them from solution. It makes the muscle less acidic. Lactic acid doesn't exist. Pyruvic acid doesn't exist. Making lactate actually gets rid of some acidity, but that's not to say that the muscle doesn't get acidic. You can, with really intense exercise, make the muscle acidic. And it is dangerous. Proteins can start to unravel. And acidity in the muscle is a signal to stop exercising. Part of why you feel really fatigued and lethargic might be signals from the muscle saying it's really acidic. That acidity comes in the breakdown of ATP. So myosin breaking down ATP. Sodium potassium ATPase breaking down ATP. Calcium pumps breaking down ATP. As you break that phosphate off, it releases a hydrogen ion. The muscle can be acidic. At really high exercise intensities, when you have a lot of ATP breakdown, you'll get a lot of acidity. It's not due to lactic acid. And at the risk of complicating things even more for you, I'll, I'll leave it there. But if you have questions, by all means, feel free to ask. Now, I just want to show you a brief video um, because we've talked about a lot of concepts just in, in theory. Phosphocreatine, well, it's a thing inside the muscle. ATP is a thing inside the muscle. There's enzymes and pathways, and we map them out on the uh, title header slide of this section. How do we know? How can we ever look inside the muscle and measure something there, right? It's, it's microscopic. I should, I should say that if you're somewhat squeamish, maybe you don't want to watch this video. But it's not, it's not gory. It's not gruesome. We, um, we know because we don't go inside the muscle to look at things. We take the muscle out of the body. And then we grind it up, and then we run it through some preparations and take a look at the things that are going on. So this, whoa, play. This is how we do that. This is the muscle biopsy technique. This is actually a microbiopsy. So this is a smaller version. And you can see in this individual, in this individual, there's a, a little catheter. This is a needle point. It's going to be inserted through the skin and through the fat and through the, the fascia into the belly of the muscle. So it slides between the fibers. And then maybe I'll let, I'll let the description do it. 
I'll tell you more about it afterwards. You okay? Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, there's, there's local anesthetic, so you can't really feel the pinprick, which is good. You saw the, the catheter slide in, and that just makes a nice little opening. It makes a little tunnel into the muscle. There's not even any blood here. It's not that bad. So now we take essentially like a mechanical pencil. It has a little window at the bottom and you insert that into the tunnel. The muscle goes into the window. And then like a guillotine, it cuts off some muscle fibers. And then you pull that out and you Put it onto liquid nitrogen, you freeze it up, you grind it up. It's got all that good stuff. It's got myosin, it's got ATP, it's got creatine in it, it's got fats. Sometimes you do it twice, two times in the same hole. Ooh. I can still feel it. I can still feel it. Oh. And you can see the preparations. So it's going right into a vat of liquid nitrogen. We're separating them out. I've had 32 of those in my career. Do you want the summary now, or do you want me to post it? How about now and post it? I'll post it. Have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday.